I'm Sarah Ihan, and in this video I want to introduce you to the topic of logical connectors. I'm a PhD student in logic, philosophical logic to be more specific, and I'm working in the area of proof theoretic semantics. This is about, I will tell you in a few minutes, first of all a few words about me. Um, so I'm located at the Ruhr University in Bochum, which is in the western part of Germany. And while the city is not particularly known to be very pretty or nice, uh, I really like it here because uh, we have an amazing logic group here at our university. It's uh, yeah, a lot of people working in our department, very lively research community. So I'm really happy to be part of this. And the head of uh, our group is my PhD supervisor, Professor Heinrich Wansing. Uh, who has done some very fundamental research on uh, logical connectors. So that's how I got into the topic as well. And yeah, as in every logic department, um, or at least I think this is the case, we have some people who are more um, mathematically minded or interested and others who are more on the philosophical side. And yes, I'm definitely more coming from philosophy Although I must admit, I would love to have a stronger math background, but I studied um, philosophy in my undergrad. And this is not to say that this is bad at all um, for doing logic. Um, on the contrary, I think uh, having studied philosophy can, you, can give you great insights and perspectives on what could be interesting questions in logic. So my interests lie very much in the area of proof theory. As you know, there are different proof systems, uh, different kinds of proof systems, and depending on your yeah, professor's preferences, you probably got at least um, to know one in your logic introductory class. So I would categorize these kinds of proof systems into four categories. Um, there are definitely other ways to do this or more categories uh, to open up, but um, this is a classic way, I would say. So there are axiomatic proof systems, often also called Hilbert style proof systems, then tableau systems, systems of natural deduction, and sequence calculus systems. I'm only interested in, in the two latter ones, so in natural deduction and sequence calculus. And uh, yeah, let me maybe quickly explain why this is the case. This has to do with the question of proof theoretic semantics. So what is proof theoretic semantics? Mm. A response that I got once when I told a fellow PhD uh, logic student that I'm working on proof theoretic semantics was, well, that sounds like a contradiction. And I mean, that amused me a lot because, um, of course, it's not a contradiction, but I understood where he was coming from. So the thing is, if we think of a logical system, is divided into syntax on the one hand and semantics on the other. Um, yeah, syntax would be the defined language of our um, logic, the proof system, so everything that is about what strings of symbols are allowed in our logic without attaching any meaning to them. And semantics on the other hand um, is then about interpretations, evaluations, meaning. And the most traditional view on how to assign meaning in logic uh, is to use model theory. So uh, the central notion here is then truth. So that would be a kind of um, truth conditional approach to meaning, according to which you would say, for example, um, for classical propositional logic, uh, that the meaning of the logical connectors is given by the truth tables assigned to them. So, if you have this view then, then of course this uh, term proof theoretic semantics would sound a bit odd, because you're throwing together what you've learned to keep separated. Syntax, proof theory on the one hand, and semantics, model theory on the other hand. Mm. However, as I just told you, this is the traditional, the received view, but this has been challenged by other semantics on the logical market, um, like proof theoretic semantics or 
Other examples that could be mentioned are um, game theoretic semantics, algebraic semantics. But I want to talk about proof theoretic semantics here um, and the conception behind this. So, as always, there would be a lot more to say about this than I could possibly do here. So, I won't even try. Um, but as a reference, there is a very good Stanford Encyclopedia article uh, on that written by Professor Peter Schröder-Heister, who also, by the way, uh, coined this term proof theoretic semantics in the middle of the 80s. So, uh, the, re the references will all be given uh, below the video later. But yeah, the central claim of proof theoretic semantics is that what gives you the meaning of logical connectives is the rules of inference governing their use. So meaning is based on the concept of proof here, not on the concept of truth. It's not the truth tables or models or the like that give us the meaning of logical connectives, but their rules. And the supposed advantage of such a view is that it can be seen to be um, less metaphysically challenged um, because we do not have to say anything um, about the yeah, difficult question uh, of what truth is actually. And as such, proof theoretic semantics stands in a line of heritage of use theoretic approaches, going back to Wittgenstein uh, with his famous meaning is use claim. And it is also seen to be part of what is called inferentialism, which is usually considered to be a more broader concept, uh, not only focusing on logical expressions or proof theory. Okay, and with this on the table, you might already see why from a proof theoretic semantics point of view, for example, axiomatic proof, proof systems are not that interesting. In axiomatic systems, you usually don't have a lot of rules. You have axioms and maybe just one rule, just modus ponens, for example. And even if you would want to consider axioms as zero premise rules, you don't have rules for this or that connective. Um, the axioms may contain different connectives, for example. So the system of rules would look very different from um, that that we are used in uh, natural reduction or sequence calculus, and it would be hard in such a system to say that the rules determine the connective's meaning. And that is actually where we get into um, a yeah, first restriction on how rules should look like if we want them to give us the meaning of the connective displayed in this rule. Namely, that the rules should not contain more than one connective. This property of rules is sometimes called purity or separability. And yeah, from a proof theoretic semantics point of view, this is a property that we want, right? Why is this the case? Because otherwise we would get into trouble explaining how it is that the rules determine the meaning of a connective if those rules contain another connective whose meaning, in turn, also must be determined by rules. So, either this other connective is characterized by pure rules, but then it would seem that this is a more primitive connective than the other. Or it is also characterized by impure rules, so the rules contain another connective. Thus, we would get into um, a kind of holistic system. And if every rule displays more than one connective, then probably we would get some circularity in determining the meaning of uh, the connectives of our system. Okay, and a kind of proof system that seems very suitable for this project of proof theoretic semantics, because it has the structure of having rules for our connectives, characterizing how they are behaving as premises and as conclusions, is natural deduction. So natural deduction, and there are especially the style Gerhard Gensen introduced, so where you have more of a tree structure than a linear system, a la Lemon or Fitch. Um, this is standardly the preferred system in proof theoretic semantics. There's also a line uh, in proof theoretic semantics that favors uh, sequence calculus systems, or at least we'll say 
that those systems are equally strong in giving the meaning of the connectives. And I personally think there is something to that. <laughs> but I won't talk about this here in detail. Um, let's just focus on natural reduction. That's complicated enough. Um, so remember, in natural reduction, we usually have two kinds of rules. Introduction and elimination rules. The introduction rules tell us under what circumstances we can introduce a formula containing the connective into our system. While the elimination rules tell us that um, what we can infer from such a formula. Okay. Talking about proof theoretic semantics, I want to show you a famous quote now, which is always quoted in this context, so I have to do it too, of course. It's by Gerhard Gensen, who famously introduced one of these nice natural reduction systems we use, and who also came up with the system of sequence calculus. And he said, the introductions represent, as it were, the definitions of the symbols concerned, and the eliminations are no more in the final analysis than the consequences of these definitions. So here, there's a focus uh, on the introduction rules, definitely. Mm. And this is um, traditionally the case in proof theoretic semantics, although this has changed too in the um, past few decades. There are people who would argue that it is the elimination rules who, which are more uh, important, and others uh, who would say that uh, yeah, both rules are on a par, basically. So what this boils down to, if we take a um, simple case of conjunction, would be to say, okay, here we have these um, natural deduction rules for conjunction, the introduction rules, the elimination rules, and in some way, like I said, there are different approaches to, to the details, but it is these rules that give the meaning of conjunction, not the truth table of conjunction. Now, the question is, what could be the problem with such an approach? And this has been spelled out by Arthur Pryor in a rather short paper in 1960, where he introduces the infamous connective tongue to show that an approach such as proof theoretic semantics, back then the word proof theoretic semantics didn't exist, but uh, an approach in that spirit, that this could be led ad absurdum. So, his point was to say, okay, if it's only the rules that give us the meaning of the connectives, there's nothing like meaning as such behind them, then I will just give you uh, this connective. And if you ask what is the meaning, well, here are the rules. The rules are that from A, we can derive A to B, uh, and from A to B, we can derive B. Great. Why would such a connective be problematic? Well, of course, because it would trivialize our system. With this, we could go from A, arbitrary A, to A chunk B, and then to B. So everything could be derived from anything, basically. Yeah, and this would be hugely undesirable. Yeah? So there are different ways, approaches, how to tackle this tongue problem, but in general, they all have in common that um, we should not let this happen. We should not have um, a trivialization of a system. We should not have a system where um, uh, anything can be derived from arbitrary formulas. So basically, since then, it has been the task of proof theoretic semantics to give some criteria, some restrictions for rules to distinguish those tongue-like rules um, from the rules that are obviously okay. So we must find criteria that let us include the rules for conjunction, disjunction, implication, and so on, but which allow us to say, no, these uh, tongue rules uh, are uh, not allowable for this and that reason. It sounds very easy because these tongue rules look very weird, but it's really not, because uh, there has been a lot of work on this and no answer that has been mm, well accepted by everyone in the field, I would say. So this is really 
an interesting question to come up with some really hard criteria to distinguish okay and not okay rules. One notion that occurs frequently in this context is the notion of harmony, which should govern the relation between introduction and elimination rules and which is said um, yeah, not to be existent in the case of the Tong rules. It is, however, subject of a huge debate uh, what exactly makes up this principle. So really informally speaking, harmony is used as a concept of some kind of balance between the introduction and elimination rules, which somehow ensures uh, an inclusion and ex exclusion of tongue-like rules. Um, for a formal sketch of yeah, these various proposals of this concept, uh, you can see, for example, uh, the paper by Nissen Frances and Roy Dukov. And um, okay, so one, one approach that is very prominent uh, is by Doug Pravitz, um, and is the so called inversion principle. Um, this inversion principle is supposed to give an answer of how the elimination rules could be justified given the introduction rules. If a set of introduction and elimination rules adhere to the inversion principle, this means that a proof, as Private says, a proof of the conclusion of an elimination is already contained in the proofs of the premises when the major premise is inferred by introduction. So, in this sense, according to Pravitz, the elimination rules are justified by the meaning of the logical constants, which are stated by the introduction rules. Because the conclusion of the elimination rule says not more than what is already given by the meaning of its major premise. And Tong fails to adhere to this principle, of course, because it cannot be said that uh, a proof of B, in our example, um, is already contained in, uh, in A. But yeah, that was just to give you an idea of one approach. There are many others. Um, it has also to do um, with what makes up an, a conservative extension of our system with a connector, for example, or Dummett uh, uses this concept and then um, and then uh, distinguishes between local and total harmony. Um, others uh, argued more in the direction of uh, normalizability uh, of the derivations. So there's a lot going on. There are numerous approaches. Um, but right now I'd like to draw attention to another issue at hand, which uh, comes up in a response to Pryor's paper, namely uh, by Belner in uh, 1962, and um, yeah, there it only appears, uh, so it rather appears as a side note, but it's the question of uniqueness of connectives. Okay, so what is uniqueness about? This is the question whether a connective is characterized by the rules governing its use in a way that there's at most one connective playing this specific inferential role. So we have a connective, let's take conjunction for example, we have our introduction and elimination rules for conjunction. The question is then, are these rules, um, define, uh, do they define the connective in a way that they permit at most one inferential role for the connective to play? So it must be the case that there cannot be two connectives characterized by the same set of rules, but otherwise playing different roles in inference. So we say that a connective is uniquely determined if and only if, when it's duplicated by a copycat connective governed by exactly the same rules, they play exactly the same role, both in premises and in conclusion. So the question is, of course, then how can we check whether a logical connective is uniquely determined by its rules. And usually, I must uh, emphasize usually, um, interdrivability is taken as the qualifying criterion. So 
the standard cases, we must show that if we have um, a, two formulas, one containing the connective, the other the copycat connective, those two formulas must be interderivable. So I will show it to you for the case of conjunction, so that you can see for conjunction it's very unproblematic to do that. Um, we take uh, yeah, for conjunction and a copycat connective conjunction prime, um, being defined by the same introduction and elimination rules as conjunction. Then we can see, okay, we can easily derive A and B from A um, conjunction prime B and A conjunction prime B from A conjunction B. So you may wonder by now, okay, I can really imagine a connective where it's not unproblematic. Let me show you an example. So this is Belknap's uh, original um, counterexample to uniqueness. Um, he says, okay, let's consider a connective Planck, which is um, specified by just one rule, namely that from B we can derive A Planck B, and a copycat connective Plink, which is governed by exactly the same rule. So from B we can derive A Plink B. And the thing is, given only these rules for Planck, we cannot show that it is unique, at least not um, if we assume what Bernard does. If we assume, mm, uh, if we make certain background assumptions on um, yeah, derivability relations in our system, um, which we do here by assuming uh, Gensen's structural rules, so permutativity, transitivity, and so on. So if we make this assumption, which we usually do for our derivability relations, um, then we would get the uniqueness of Planck if we could show that A Planck B and A Planck B are mutually interderivable. But this is not possible to show. Um, although Planck is governed by the same rule as Planck, uh, with these rules, you can see maybe where the problem lies. We only uh, we only have some information how it behaves on the right side of the sequence, or how it behaves as a conclusion, but nothing that tells us how to introduce it to the premises, mm. or how to derive something uh, from it um, by uh, by the premises. So uh, Bernab concludes they could stand theoretically for different connectives. What I want to yeah, mention as an interesting fact, however, it is not only um, some ad hoc made up rules um, that uh, for, for which we can show an example where uniqueness might fail, but there has been extensive work on this by uh, Lloyd Humberstone, for example, who shows some very interesting uh, examples where uniqueness fails from systems which we actually use. So, for example, for uh, modal logic, that um, the connective uh, box, uh, yeah, for necessity, fails to be unique, uh, uniquely characterized by the rules in uh, system K, for example, or uh, he shows it for negation in the logic FDE. So yeah, these are there are like real examples from uh, our, our logical systems where we can have a failure of uniqueness. And a last point I would like to mention on this point of uniqueness because it will be important uh, for my example. I want to show you in a few minutes uh, is the point about congruentiality of a system. So. A logic is said to be congruential um, if we have if we have the case that for all formulas that are interderivable, it is also the case that uh, compounds formed by uh, in in the same way by these two formulas are also interderivable. For the first case, if two formulas are interderivable, we can say that they are equivalent. If also all the compounds formed by these formulas are interderivable, then we can say 
that the formulas are synonymous. And this is uh, important for uniqueness because uh, as Humberstone um, emphasizes, uh, or he makes this distinction, um, he says, okay, in congruential logics, uniqueness, uh, uh, it is enough to show this uniqueness to within equivalence, or to show this interdivability of formulas. Um, but in non-congruential logics, this is not enough. We have to show um, that the stronger notion uh, also holds. So we have to show that all these compounds formed by uh, this um, formula containing the connective and the copycat connective, that those are interderivable. And then we can speak of uniqueness to within synonymy. What I want to do in the last part of this video now is to introduce you to um, yeah, a concept and a logical system which you may not be familiar with yet, um, which has to do with bilateralism. Okay, so bilateralism, what is this about? It is an approach to meaning and logical consequence, which says that these concepts should not merely rely on a positive notion, such as assertions, truth, provability, but equally on a complementary concept, like denial, falsity, refutability. So it is the view that we should consider these positive and negative categories on a par, both as primitive, not reducible to each other. And this goes against well, a traditional view which has been, for example, proposed by Frege, that to deny um, a sentence A, for example, is merely to assert the negation of A. In bilateralism, we would, we would reject such a statement. Um, we would say that um, the concept of denial is prior to the concept of negation, so that negation is to be analyzed in terms of denial and not the other way around. Probably the most um, famous uh, example of um, bilateralist um, proof system, um, okay, because he started also um, with this term bilateralism for that, uh, is given by Rumford in his yes and no paper uh, from 2000. So there he gives a natural reduction system with assigned formulas, for assertion and denial. You could also, um, and this is more the, um, the direction I'm going uh, with, say that in the context of proofs, we do not have to talk about speech acts like assertion and denial, but we can also just talk about refutability, provability, and then say something like the refutability uh, of a formula A is not just provability of the negated formula. So refutation of A is not equal to proving not A. And in this uh, direction, then, uh, we could say that uh, it is, we should not only consider the proof conditions of our connectives, but also the refutation conditions. And with this, we can say that proof theoretic semantics should also um, consider more than just proofs, but something like dual proofs. What are dual proofs? Mm, this would be um, a, a notion arising from two notions of logical consequence then. We, could, we can take our usual consequence relation capturing the notion of verification from premises to conclusion and also then a dual counterpart capturing the notion of falsification from premises to conclusion, which would be then which would make up dual proofs then. Let me show this, uh, how this would work. So as an example, I want to show you now um, natural deduction rules uh, for a certain logic, uh, which we call two-int. Um, I will tell you in a minute um, what is behind that name. Um, but this natural deduction system does not only comprise the usual introduction and elimination rules that we know, but also introduction and elimination rules for dual proofs. So here you have an example 
for um, conjunction. Um, and now you read the single lines as rules uh, for um, as proofs and the double lines uh, for dual proofs. So you can read the, the the ones above you know from just these are the normal natural deduction rules, right? And the ones below, these will tell you, for example, if you have a refutation of A, then you also have a refutation of A and B. The same for B, for example. And uh, for the elimination rule, this tells you what can you um, infer from the, the refutation of A and B. You can see already that this looks very much uh, like the rule for disjunction. This is because conjunction and disjunction are dual connectors. I have to show you another example, um, the rules for implication. Again, the first ones you know, usual introduction and em uh, elimination rule. And then uh, the other ones will tell you, okay, when can you refute A implication B? If you have a proof of A and a refutation of B. And the elimination rules, the D stands for dual, uh, dual proof rules, tell you what can you infer from a refutation of A implies B. From this you can infer a proof of A or also a refutation of B. So what you can see with such a system, um, with such a concept of bilateralism, would be in uh, the spirit of proof theoretic semantics to say, well, the meaning of the connectives is not only determined by uh, the proof rules, but we also need the refutation rules. Both of them give us the meaning of a connective. And one curiosity that um, arises in our system here, uh, which is also why I wanted to choose, uh, choose it as an example for this introduction about logical connectives, is that actually here we have um, a non-standard connective, which is called co-implication. This is a connective um, which is supposed to be dual to implication. Why do we get this? Well, the thing is, if we take this idea of falsification being equally important and primitive as verification, if we take this seriously, then we kind of need this to get this um, yeah, balance that we want in our bilateral system. So, as we can see, um, both implication and co-implication can be understood to express certain concepts of entailment in the object language. So, just as um, we always get a, we get a derivation of A implies B, if and only if there is a derivation from A to B, so in this case, um, the implication is a manifestation of uh, the, our concept of entailment in the object language. Just uh, like this, we get, we get a dual derivation of, we read this as like the other way around, B co implies A. If and only if there is a dual derivation, so falsifying premises leads to falsifying the conclusion from B to A. So again here, if we say we have these two concepts of entailment, then well, with co-implication we also have a, we have means to express this in our object language. Now I want to show you the rules for co-implication. As you can see here, I'm showing you the rules for implication too, so that you can see um, how they are dual. And um, yes, for example, uh, to introduce uh, B co implies A, Therefore, we need a proof of A and a refutation of B. Um, or this we read as uh, from the assumption that A is false. Um, if, if we can, from the assumption that A is false, uh, get a refutation of B, then we can also refute A co implies B. And this is also why the uh, logic I, yeah, I showed you the natural reduction system for is called 2int um, because it is a bi-intuitionistic logic. So bi-intuitionistic logic is intuitionistic logic conservatively extended with co-implication 
it could also be seen as a union of intuitionistic logic, which only has implication and not co-implication, and dual intuitionistic logic, which lacks implication but has co-implication. And yeah, here you can see we can have non-standard connectives, um, which still, like this is a conservative extension, this basically means, um, I did not give you uh, the formal definition of this, but it basically means that it does not, not mess up our system, that um, there's no trivialization or anything, um, so we can extend our, sys uh, our usual systems uh, with non-standard connectives that are not behaving like Tonk. Now, what I also want to show you um, with my example of this logic 2 int is how we can think about the question of uniqueness, which I mentioned earlier. So the uniqueness of connectors, um, can we be sure that our set of rules for the connectives define at most one, so a unique connective um, in our logic? And what causes trouble in two end is that here we have two sets of rules and two consequence relations, right? So we have this proof and this refutation relation, and we have the proof rules and the dual proof rules. And now it could be we could be thinking about this as the proof rules generating the consequence relation for provability and the dual proof rules generating the one for dual provability. The thing is then that we can show basically the opposite of what we showed for Plonk and Plink. There, the, the one rule that defined the connective, that was not enough um, to make sure that it is a unique connective. Here, the connectives of two end are basically already uniquely characterized for both consequence relations individually by only a part of their set of rules. So let me show you um, what I mean by this. We can show, uh, as I showed you before for conjunction, that um, conjunction um, in A conjunction B is interderivable for our, um, let's say, positive consequence relation um, with A conjunction prime B conjunction prime being defined by the same proof rules as conjunction. And likewise, we can show that if we take now a copycat connective uh, conjunction double prime, um, which is defined by the same dual proof rules as conjunction, that here we also get this interderivability between A conjunction B and A conjunction double prime B. However, what we cannot show is that um, A conjunction B um, is interdivable for the positive consequence relation with A conjunction double prime B, or the same thing for the negative consequence relation and conjunction prime B. So the question is, how can we know then there's, that there's only one conjunction with a unique meaning? and that we're not forced to say that there are actually two conjunctions, one for proving and one for refuting. And that would be, of course, very undesirable from a proof theoretic semantics point of view. But we want to say that the meaning of the connectives is determined by their rules, and our rules give us then uh, one meaning for proving things uh, for conjunction, and one for uh, and another meaning for a uh, refutation context, that would be odd. That is not what we want to say. We want to say that conjunction has one meaning, whether we prove or we refute with it. Okay, so this might seem problematic, but let me show you why there's a way out of this. Let's take a look at our rules again, namely at the rules for implication and co-implication the dual proof rules for implication and the proof rules for co-implication actually show us that our consequence relations are intertwined in the characterization of the connectives. So the rules for implication and for co-implication, they need both derivability relations in one single rule. 
So this shows us that it is not correct to think of the proof rules to generate the, the positive consequence relation and the dual proof rules, the uh, dual consequence relation, but that yeah, they are um, both, uh, that they are intertwined in the characterization of the connectors. And this means that we are not allowed to use different duplications of a connective if we want to show its uniqueness. So when duplicating a connective, we need to use the same duplication for both proof and for the dual proof rules. And thereby it is ensured that we're not talking about different connectives. So we do not have this one conjunction for proving and one conjunction for refuting. And what we have to do then just to ensure uniqueness in such a um, bilateralist setting is just to modify our definition of uniqueness for bilaterally defined connectives and say that in a bilateralist setting with consequence relations for verification as well as for falsification, we do not only have to demand the interdivability um, of the formula and, uh, its comp um, and its copycat connective, but we also have to demand that they are duly interdivable. So we have to demand the interdivability for both consequence relations. And the advantage of this is that thereby, because the interdivability for both consequence relations uh, already ensures us that we have synonymy between the formulas, we get uh, with this modified definition, we get uniqueness to within synonymy, not only uniqueness to within equivalence. Yes, this was my introduction on the topic of logical connectors and on my research in this area. I really hope it got some of you maybe interested in this field of research. And you can find the, um, the references in, this, in the description of this video. And also here's my email address. So if you yeah, want to contact me on anything, I'd be more than happy to hear from you. Last but not least, I would like to thank Maria and Gabrielle for inviting me to do this here. It was a lot of fun. Thanks again and bye. Mm -hmm.